Hello, my name is Rivana Rocha. I'm head of the remote sensing group at the University of Bonn. And in the next 20 to 30 minutes, I will talk about generative models and how they can be used for agriculture and for viticulture. So agriculture is a timely and important topic in our society and advances in research areas such as geodesy, plant sciences, computer science, but also economics are bringing us closer to a greater goal of sustainability. So when we look at the following scenario here, uh, we can have the following questions. So we can ask, for example, what is on the field, or we can ask what is the yield in this specific area, or we can ask how um, or what will this plant look like tomorrow. But we can also ask why does a plant look like this. And one way to approach these questions is data science and machine learning. So data science is a field of study that uses scientific approaches to extract knowledge and insights from data. And machine learning is a set of techniques that allow computers to learn from data. And one part of machine learning is deep learning. And machine learning can be used within the field of data science. So here you can see the typical machine learning pipeline. So we have given uh, some measurements here. Uh, they can, for example, be close range or satellite based, and we want to have a specific output given here. So the measurements are denoted by X and uh, the target output, uh, or the, also known as the labels, um, are given as Y in the, for the rest of the talk. And the machine learning model here in the middle is simply put the mathematical relationship between the input and the output. And such a machine learning model usually contains a lot of parameters which are learned uh, so that the input can be mapped uh, to the output. And once such a model is learned, it can be applied to a, a different but similar input data. So a very common approach to learn this model is supervised learning and uh, supervised learning uh, the principle is illustrated here and in this setting we have given pairs of uh, uh, feature vectors x and uh, the labels y that are our target outputs. And typical input features are for example the plant height or just an image with spectral information or for example environmental factors which gives us um, which gives us the information of the related to the current task. And target outputs are what you are interested in. So this can be uh, the analysis on um, what is on the field, or it can be more specific that you want to have specific uh, plant species. And in this case, we speak about classification. If you want to have a continuous output, uh, such as the biomass or the leaf area, here we speak of regression, and this is also possible in such a uh, supervised uh, learning setting. Then there's a distinction we can make uh, when we talk about classification, which is uh, discriminative learning and generative learning. So discriminative classifier have to go to determine a decision boundary. So what you have given here is you have uh, two classes and we have also given um, two features for each data point of these classes and what you want to have in the end is this uh, decision boundary here. So that's the overall goal. You want to discriminate between the classes. And in contrast to this are generative classifiers uh, where the goal is to learn the underlying structure of the data. So this is illustrated here. And so once you have learned the underlying structure of the data, you can derive a decision boundary from, uh, from it, so it uh, can also be used for classification. The concept of generative learning can also be found when you perform unsupervised learning. So here, uh, what you want to do is you want to find patterns in your data or you want to find specific groups that is illustrated here. So here you have two groups. Uh, of the data, it means two clusters. But as it can uh, can be seen here, you only have access to the data, so you have uh, don't you don't have these pairs, so you have don't have labels given, and so you don't have any reference target outputs. Um, 
Such approaches are also uh, very useful in agriculture um, because not always you have access to target outputs or labels. But now you can ask, so why should we learn the underlying structure of your data? And I will tell you why you should do it. Um, so let me give you an example why it can be super useful. Uh, and one typical example are autoencoders. Autoencoders are neural networks. And as a reminder, neural networks are a complex chain of mathematical operation. And each of these blocks here illustrated in this plot represent such an operation like nonlinear activations or uh, convolutions, which extract distinct spatial information from data, which is especially useful for images. So you have an, um, so you've given an input and all these operations are applied uh, in a chain and the output is the result. So autoencoders are used to learn a so-called low-dimensional latent space. And this low-dimensional latent space is exactly this plot here, this block here in the middle. And this is nothing else than a low-dimensional feature space, which contains in the best case only the explanatory factors which causes the observations. So in the, in the end, this is nothing else than a very smart dimensionality reduction. And an autoencoder consists of an uh, encoder and a decoder. And the encoder learns uh, the mapping from the data to this, uh, to this low dimensional um, latent space here. And the decoder maps the latent space back to your output. And in this case, uh, we want to have our data reconstructed. So you want, uh, in the best case, you want to have uh, your input data again. And the, auto, uh, the, the encoder and the decoder can take many forms. And uh, in our case here, uh, we use the neural network. Um, and here you can see, so in this illustration, you can see um, examples of so images from the, from the vineyard. So it's an image of grapevine and the autoencoder tries to reprodu reproduce this image. That means the neural network tries to learn the underlying structure of the data by optimizing all the parameters in the network, which define the mathematical operations included in, uh, in the network. And the goal is to learn the parameters in such a way that the difference between the image and the reconstruction is small. And this is given here on the top by this loss function. This, one's, uh, this is the goal uh, for you, that this is minimized. So that means the reconstruction error should be low. So for what is it useful? As I said, the latent representation should capture only the relevant features. So imagine you, um, you would learn a representation for the standard appearance of grape wine, of healthy grape wine. For example, from a lot of images you, take, uh, you, um, you have taken from the vineyard, um, for example, like this here. So here uh, you can see a few images, and these are images of different BBCH uh, stages, which is the, the, uh, the development stage of grape wines, not only for grape wines, for um, also a lot of uh, other plants. But here we have given two BBCH st stages and also different varieties taken by this modified harvester with a camera system in it. So it's not harvesting anymore, but it has uh, cameras in it to take these images in a more or less controlled environment. If you then apply the model which you have learned on the healthy grape wines to grape wines with diseases, the model has never seen such an appearance before and therefore it will not be able to reconstruct uh, the disease part and will give you a high reconstruction error in, uh, in, this, in these areas. And this is illustrated uh, here. So what you can see uh, here are images. These are image patches from these images. Here are the heat maps. These heat maps visualize the reconstruction error. And here in the bottom, you can see um, uh, annotation from the expert. So an expert uh, marked for us where are deceased parts in the image. And you can see that the reconstruction error is actually high. So these heat maps um, 
the, the reconstruction error is high in, in uh, areas where are diseases. So these heat maps can be used to detect the diseases. But since this approach can not only uh, be used to detect uh, diseases, but uh, in general anomalous parts, which are not represented in the data, this whole approach uh, is called anomaly detection. And outdoor coders are really cool, but in a basic form, uh, they are only, uh, they're actually not uh, generative models, but they very often build the basis uh, for generative models. But because my talk is about generative models, I want to talk a bit more about it. Uh, so generative uh, models can do even more than reconstruction. They learn the underlying structure of the data and enable a generation of new samples. That's why it's called um, generative models. So given here on the left, you can see uh, examples from the distribution PData, which is nothing else than the true distribution of all training samples, like the healthy uh, grapes in the vineyard. And the goal is to generate new samples uh, from the same distribution. But PData is nothing what you have. It would be nice, but you don't have it. But what you can do is you can learn a distribution P model here, which is as close as possible to P data. And this can be done explicitly, for example, by defining P model as a parametric distribution as illustrated here, as a, so illustrated here as a Gaussian distribution. And then you can sample from this distribution here, for example, by using uh, the mean and the standard deviation. And, or you can do it uh, uh, implicitly, and here you can um, uh, learn a model which can sample from P model without explicitly defining it. And this is uh, what I will present in the next slides. And uh, I want to, uh, want to specifically talk about generative adversarial networks and how they can generate the unseen. And I want to, uh, I want to show you two examples which uh, are, are, uh, were, where approaches were developed in my group. One is simulation and the other one is forecasting and one deals with, uh, with, uh, uh, with grapes and the other one with uh, cauliflower. So first of all, let's talk about what uh, generative adversarial networks are. So these consist of two networks illustrated here. So a generated, uh, you have a generator G and you have a discriminator D. And both have different goals and they constantly fight against each other during the model learning process. This is called adversarial training. In a nutshell, the goal of a generator is to, as the name says, generate images and the goal of the discriminator is to distinguish between real images which are, really exist and images that were generated by the generator. But let's have a more de detailed look into it. So the generator, as mentioned before, generates uh, images. Normally we input uh, data to a neural network that we want to to do something with, like a prediction, or we want to make a classification with it. But what actually uh, do we use as input for network that outputs um, entirely new images? In its most basic form, uh, generative adversarial network takes random noise, here illustrated <laughs> there. So it takes random noise and um, then it turns this random noise into something uh, really meaningful. And it doesn't matter how much, uh, it doesn't really matter how uh, much, what kind of noise it is. Uh, so we can just choose something that is easy to sample from, like a uniform distribution. And it turned out that the space from which the noise is sample is usually of a smaller dimension than the output dimension. But in order to learn this generator, we need another part, uh, the discriminator illustrated here. So that's actually the whole part here. In principle, the discriminator D learns to classify between a generated image and a real image. There, so here, this is the generated image on top are the real images from the training data. But uh, there's... Um, uh, another crucial thing, actually, we do not want to have the image 
to be arbitrary, but um, so fortunately we can condition uh, on something. For example, on the appearance of an additional input image, like um, here, um, which is for example from an earlier point in time, or we can um, condition it uh, on a specific point in time we want to generate or environmental factors. The advantage uh, in, in general to predict the whole appearance of a plant and not only to um, directly estimate specific parameters is that you're more flexible in what you can do with the result uh, because it's just like when you would observe it uh, with a sensor, so it's some kind of virtual sensor measurement. And to make it a little bit more formal, here is um, the basic optimization function to determine the parameters of the generator. This loss is called minimax loss and you can see here that you have two terms, it's a min and a max, that's why it's called minimax loss and also it consists uh, of two parts. Um, so you have here the first part and in the end, so here is the second part. Um, so in, in, um, Let's go a little bit more into detail, detail what actually is in this equation. So what you can see here is um, this here is the generator's output, the G of, of Z, uh, Z. Z is the, is the noise input um, and G is the generator and this uh, E is the expected value over all generated samples. So actually you generate a lot of these um, you generate, uh, you, you generate a lot of these um, uh, images uh, based on randomly sampled set, uh, set vectors. And then in the first part of the equation you have um, here, this is uh, the discriminator score that a real data sample is actually real. And here is the expected value over all real data instances. So um, in practice, there are uh, a lot of modification because this minimax, uh, the optimization of this minimax loss is quite uh, challenging and the convergent is really hard to reach. But this is the basic form which this takes and the discriminator wants to maximize and the generator wants to min minimize. That's the general principle you can find everywhere in this adversary training. Okay, so let me show you uh, the applications. And so let's have a look at the first example. Let's say we go into the vineyard and you want to estimate the yield of berries. Besides direct measurements, uh, the number and the size of berries is a good indicator for the yield. But as you can see here in this image, um, a lot of these berries are covered by leaves, so the estimation, there's always an underestimation and all the berries behind the leaves are not counted. And this is a problem, so therefore we started to work on a method to estimate what is likely behind uh, the leaves. But we are not aiming at estimating the actual reference, uh, just a likely uh, scenario. And we use the generative adversarial network in which the generator is able to, uh, to generate an image without leaves given the image with leaves. So this is uh, actually, so here is an image in one domain or this is actually one domain where you have images with leaves and here's the other domain where you have images without leaves. And this is a so-called image to image translation where the output is conditioned on the input. So here you do not want to have an arbitrary image uh, generated. You want, to, you want uh, to have it conditioned on the input, which is actually you want to have uh, the whole scene, but you want to remove uh, the leaves from it. And you could imagine it as a complex transformation from one domain to another domain. But what is actually happening is that the model samples implicitly from a learned distribution with a condition on the input image. And the challenge is now uh, that that's uh, actually a nice approach, uh, but it's really hard to get training data for it because here you need actually such, such pairs of uh, 
to train the model, to train a generator which can actually do this. But we uh, had a smart idea and so we uh, overcame the challenge and we did the following. So first we collected images of occluded berries and non-occluded berries from the field. So this can actually be seen here. So these um, belong together and we co collected um, such images. Um, but it was a huge effort to align these uh, because every time you cut away the leaves, uh, the scene changes. So you need, and also you need to, to drive at least two times through the uh, rows in the vineyard. So you actually need to register them. So this here is one really good example where we could do it, but this was not the easy task. So because of this, we did it only for a few scenes, which we later used for the evaluation. And instead of doing um, this for more scenes, uh, we added synthetic image pairs because neural networks need a lot of training data. And so the generator is only good when you have a lot of uh, training data uh, to, um, yeah, to, uh, to train all the parameters in the network. And we did this by using images uh, without leaves, which we synthetically covered by single cutting out uh, leaves so what you can see here in this image is we had a, an image without, uh, without leaves and then we cut it out one leaf and put it in. In our first experiments, we observed that color will not increase the accuracy, uh, just the computation time. That's why we use only gray value images. And then, because actually in the end, we want to count berries. Um, we used a single berry detection algorithm, which was uh, developed by Zababa et al., uh, also in the context of Phenorop, and added the estimated berry mass to our grayscale images. So actually, you do not have only here these, um, these uh, grayscale images, but also you have an additional channel. And this red box here is in the end what we want to estimate. This is the crucial thing uh, we want to have in the end. Okay, so here you can see some, um, some results. So on the very left, you can, uh, you can see here uh, some um, the input images. In the middle, you have uh, the real images, how the scene actually looks like. And here you can see what our algorithm estimated. And you can see it's uh, plausible. Um, of course, there's some, um, uh, some errors still because it's, uh, it's still work in progress. Um, but it's, uh, what is really nice is we never told the algorithm, uh, we never told the algorithm where actually occlusions are. So it figured out on its own where to add berries in the image. And we also did experiments where we counted the regions in the berry mass. That means the, uh, that means the berries in the end. So what you can see here is um, uh, two plots. Um, where we compared the reference, uh, the reference counting and our estimation and one dot in each of these uh, plots, this one of these blue dots means it's one image in which we counted uh, the berries. And if these uh, blue dots are on in the diagonal gray line in the, yeah, on the diagonal, uh, diagonal that means it's, uh, it's a perfect estimation. So left is when you, so here left is when you count uh, without, uh, you don't care about occlusions and right is when you, um, when you first estimate uh, when you, uh, what is behind the leaves and uh, then you, um, you count yeah, from the generated images without leaves. And we clearly see here a shift towards uh, better results. Okay. So another example is to predict plant growth. And um, in this example, the general goal is to uh, the generation of a probable future appearance of a plant. You can also think about a long-term goal, which is a data-driven growth model, conditional on factors of variation. Um, so you want not only conditioned on the image, but also taking into, into account environmental factors. Again, we have given uh, two domains here. Uh, one is from an early growth stage and the other one is from a later growth stage. 
And we trained a, a, a conditional gun uh, again, and the, sa the same as before, or a similar one, but now it predicts a future appearance of a plant. So when we applied now the, the learned generated to test images, uh, we get a generated image of a future state, and then we can apply, for example, some uh, further algorithm like to derive, for example, a segmentation of the plant. And with this, you can derive some traits on the plant uh, someone is interested in. And here you can see some further results. So again, uh, here we have some input images. These are the real images. And um, here you can see the generated images. And what we estimated is this, uh, the future appearance of uh, a plant in three weeks. And you can uh, see here, they look quite good, uh, plausible. Um, uh, there are still some artifacts in it, uh, like at the, the watering pipes, but overall we were uh, quite satisfied with the results. And the approach can also be extended uh, to come closer to our long-term goal of a data-driven growth model conditional on the factors of variation, such as the environmental factors. And for this, we trained a generative adversarial network, but uh, uh, the generative adversarial network has a learned representation in it. So in the network here, there was a representation in it of the data in the latent space that uh, is uh, here uh, in the middle illustrated. And so in this, uh, this, in this latent space, we could uh, relate our um, or the representation could be related uh, to our factors of variation. For example, one direction in this representation space can be related to a change in biomass. And to show you some examples, so here you can see the results of the generated images with the change factors of variation. So on the top you can, uh, you can see here in uh, green, light blue and dark blue, uh, the, some um, or a listing of the factors of variation for faba bean and spring wheat, and uh, on the on the very left here, um, you can see uh, the input image. The second image is uh, shows the actual ex existing situation, and the rest of the image. So these four images here on the left are actually generated images from our algorithm based uh, on. <laughs> based on the factors of variation here. So for example, in the very right image, uh, you can see that the seed number and the biomass, here, the seed number and the biomass was set to zero for faba bean, and there are actually no faba bean plants in the image which were generated, which is quite good. Uh, so we can clearly control and manipulate how the images can be generated. And this can not only be done for fava bean, we did it also for, um, for spring wheat and also for uh, mixed cropping experiments. So it's not restricted to a single plant. To conclude my talk, uh, what I showed you is uh, that generative models are useful for tasks where the underlying structure of the data is needed. And the generated data can be treated as virtual sensor data, which is really cool because then uh, you uh, then it's open what you can do with the data, or you can even fill in data gaps. And it fosters interpretable results. So in the last uh, application, I showed that you can manipulate how images are generated, and you can even um, tell others what you did and how it was generated. And, but generally, it was more difficult to learn than discriminative models. But yeah, still really cool results. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. And you can, of course, go to my website and or have a look uh, uh, to my YouTube channel where you can uh, find a lot of more videos. Uh, thanks a lot.